morning, friends. We're on chapter 7. You do not know how evil they are. Avril Harriman's first hours in Tehran were not auspicious. His limousine had to take a roundabout route from the airport in order to avoid angry mobs. He made it safely to the guest palace that had been prepared for him, but had to dine while the sound of gunfire echoed through the air. Mounted police and soldiers in armored cars were firing at protesters. By midnight, the city was awash in blood and tear gas. More than twenty people lay dead, and another two hundred were wounded. Why did the protest end with such awful carnage? The next day's newspapers blamed Mohammad Reza Shah and General Fazlola Zahedi, the hardline interior minister who, they said, had intentionally provoked violence in order to give Harriman the impression that Iran was in chaos. Prime Minister, Prime minister Mozadegh was furious and fired Zahedi before the day was out. That afternoon, Harriman paid his first call on Mozadegh. It was a meeting different from any in Harriman's long diplomatic career. He was ushered into an upstairs bedroom in Mozadegh's modest home. There, Mozadegh was reclining in bed dressed in a camel hair cloak. He welcomed Harriman weakly and said that he hoped during their talks to learn whether the United States was truly a friend of the oppressed or merely a puppet of the vile British. Harriman replied that he had lived in London and knew that there were good Britons as well as bad ones. Mozadegh demurred. You do not know them, he mumbled. You do not know them. Mozadek never saw any contradiction between his boundless respect for Britain's constitutional tradition and his contempt for its government and imperial history. During one of his meetings with Harriman, he mentioned a grandson on whom he doted. Harriman asked where the grandson was studying. Why, in England, of course, Mozadek replied. Where else? In his cables back to Washington, Harriman described Mozadek as completely rigid and obsessed with the idea of eliminating completely British oil company operations and influence within, within Iran. His impression of the old man, as related by a biographer, reflected his frustrations. Caught in deception, as he often was, Mozadegh would respond with disconcerting childlike laughter or a heartrending confession, often followed by a repeat of the devious tactic with an ill-conceived new twist. He projected helplessness, and while he was obviously as much a captive as a leader of the nationalist fanatics, he relented on nothing. Under pressure, he would take to his bed, seeming at times to have only a tenuous hold on life itself as he lay in his pink pajamas, his hands folded on his chest, his eyes fluttering and breath shallow. At the appropriate moment, though, he could transform himself from a frail, decrepit shell of a man into a wily, vigorous adversary. He would arrive at an entrance of he would arrive at the entrance of Harriman's guest palace, shuffling slowly along while leaning heavily on his cane, and once inside, he would throw the cane aside and sometimes forget where it was first time he was presented to Marie Harriman, he took hold of her hand and didn't stop kissing until he was halfway up to her elbow. Later, he could be caught stealing glances at her, sometimes losing his train of thought altogether. Harriman had brought a petroleum expert, Walter J. Levy, with him to Iran, and Levy accompanied him to several of his meetings with Mozadegh. Again and again, Levy enumerated the obstacles that Mozadegh's government would face if it tried to run the Abaddon refinery itself. There were almost no Iranians trained for senior administrative and technical positions, and even if by some miracle a way could be found to keep the oil flowing, Iran had no tankers to bring it to market. Loss of Anglo-Iranians' royalty payments, which in 1950 had reached nearly 10 million pounds, would destabilize Iran and possibly lead to Mozadegh's overthrow and replacement by a Tudor government controlled for Moscow. That, in turn, might provoke Western military intervention. None of these arguments moved Mozadegh in the slightest. Foreign interventions, he insisted, was the root of all Iran's troubles, and it all started with that Greek Alexander who had burned Persepolis twenty-four centuries before. Whenever Levy paused after making what he thought was an especially trenchant point about how much Iran would suffer if it failed to reach an accord with the British, Mozadegh would roll his eyes and reply simply, Taunt people new. Too bad for us. Harriman and his aides, accustomed to the give and take of traditional diplomacy, were driven to distraction by Mozadek's maddening style of negotiation. Dr. Mozadek had learned to take one step forward in order to take two backward, the American interpreter, interpreter Vernon Walters wrote afterward. After a day's discussion, Mr. Harriman would bring Mozadek to a certain position. The next day, when we returned to renew the discussion, not only was Mozadek not at the position where he was at the end of the previous day, he wasn't even at the position where he had been the day before that. He was somewhere back around the middle of the day before yesterday. Walters was then a lieutenant colonel in the United States Army. His language skills had brought him to the 
brought him to the attention of superiors that would help carry him through a stellar career that culminated with appointments as deputy CIA director and ambassador to Germany. He had an irreverent wit, once remarking that Mosaddegh's nose made Jimmy Durant look like an amputee. More important, he knew when to interpret literally and when to reshape in discreet comments. On one occasion, for example, Ambassador Grady's wife greeted the Iranian leader by saying, Dr. Mosaddegh, you have a very expressive face. Every time you are thinking of nothing, I can tell by the blank stare on your face. <laughs> Walter, Walters rendered this comment into French as, Dr. Mosaddegh, you have a very expressive face. Every time you are thinking deep thoughts, I can tell by the look of concentration on your face. Mosaddegh's talks with Harriman did not falter because of Mosaddegh's negotiating style or his failure to grasp the intricacies of the oil industry. The real reason was the fundamental difference in the way the two men perceived the dispute. To Harriman, it was a matter of practicalities, a set of technical challenges that could be resolved by rational analysis, discussion, and compromise. Mosaddegh saw it from an entirely different perspective. He believed that Iran was at the sublime moment of liberation. Imbued with the Shiite ideal, he was determined to pursue justice, even to the point of martyrdom. Details about refinery management or tanker capacity seemed to him laughably irrelevant at such a transcendent moment. When Harriman insisted that there must be a way for Mosaddegh to build a new relationship with the British, the old man shook his head. You do not know how crafty they are, he said. You do not know how evil they are. You do not know how they sully everything they touch. Most Iranians shared this view. As Walter Levy realized when he struck up a conversation with a group of people he met in Tehran, in, on a Tehran street. Their kiloqui, as Levy later related it, went like this. Levy, you realize that if the British technicians leave Abaddon, you'll have to try to run the industry by yourselves, Iranians, yes. You realize that you will fail to run the industry without the British, yes. So Iranian oil will no longer be produced for the world market, yes. And if Iranian oil is no longer produced, there will be no money in the Iranian treasury. Yes. And if you have no money, there will be a financial and economic collapse, which will play into the hands of the communists. Yes. Well, what are you going to do about it? Iranians. Nothing. Unable to move Mosaddegh through persuasions, Harriman decided to try influencing him indirectly. First, he asked the Shah for help. But the Shah told him frankly that in the face of public opinion, there was no way he could say a word against nationalization. Then he called Iranian reporters to a news conference, and when they arrived, he began reading a statement that called on Iran to confront the crisis with reason as well as enthusiasm. As soon as those words were out of his mouth, one journalist jumped to his feet and shouted, We in the Iranian people will all support Premier Mosaddegh and oil nationalization. The others began cheering and then marched out of the room. Harriman was left alone, shaking his head in dismay. In pondering the question of who could influence Mosaddegh and the masses, Harriman next came up with an outlandish idea. He would call on Ayatollah Kashani, the firebrand mullah, who had become one of Iran's most powerful public figures. It is difficult to imagine two more different men. Harriman came from one of the world's richest families. He was a skull and bones man at Yale, a skier and a polo player who had spent his life in the highest society. Kashani had fought in the desert against the British and been imprisoned by them, and was later sent into foreign exile at the Shah's order. He had a long black beard and wore a turban to match. His world was centered around a small, carpeted chamber where he sat for most of every day, meditating, praying, and plotting. Several times a week he emerged to visit a mosque or deliver a thunderous denunciation of imperialism to crowds of the faithful, who considered him a near deity. Harriman arrived at Kashani's door and was brought into a darkly curtained room where the holy man sat motionless. After removing his shoes, seating himself on a carpet and expressing his respect, he said he hoped Kashani agreed that the oil crisis could be resolved only by some kind of agreement between Iran and Britain. Perhaps, he ventured, Kashani could help persuade Mosaddegh to accept a British emissary. As soon as these first few sentences were translated, Kashani erupted with a stream of invective, the gist of which was that no self-respecting Iranian would ever meet with British dogs and that the United States had turned itself into Iran's enemy by suggesting it. As for Iran's oil, it could remain in the ground for all he cared. If Mosaddegh yields, he concluded, his blood will flow like Rasmara's. Not satisfied with that threat, the Ayatollah had another for Harriman himself. He asked if Harriman had heard of a major embry. When Harriman said he had not, Kashani explained, he was an American who came to Iran in 1911 or 12. He, babbled about, he dabbled in oil, 
which was none of his business, and aroused the hatred of the people. One day, walking in Tehran, he was shot down in the street, but he was not killed. They took him to the hospital. The enraged mob followed him to the hospital, burst into the hospital, and butchered him on the operating table. Do you understand? With some effort, Harriman managed to control his temper. Your eminence, he replied coldly, you must understand that I have been in many dangerous situations in my life, and I do not frighten easily. Kashana shrugged and said, well, there is no harm in trying. <laughs> Kashani's contempt for the idea of compromise, which was even more visceral than Mozadeg's, was not all that frustrating, was not all that frustrated, oh, sorry friends, was not all that frustrated Harriman. Yes, the British disgusted him just as much, as he told Akison in one cable. In spite of the fact that the British consider oil interest in Iran our greatest, their greatest overseas asset, no minister has visited Iran, as far as I can find out, except Churchill and Eden on wartime business. Oil, oil companies direct, directors rarely come. Situation that has developed here is a tragic example of abs, absentee management combined with worldwide growth of nationalism in undeveloped countries. There is no doubt Iranians are ready to make sacrifices in oil income to be rid of what they consider to be British colonial practices. Large groups are in mood to face any consequ consequences to achieve this objective. It is clear that British reporting and recommendations from here have not been realistic, and it seems essential that member of British government find out for himself what is going on here. For a time, it seemed that despite all the obstacles, some solution might be reached. Harriman finally managed to persuade Mozadeg to issue a statement saying that he would negotiate with a British envoy if the British government, on behalf of the former Anglo-Iranian oil company, recognizes the principle of nationalization of the oil industry in Iran. To his immense irritation, however, the Foreign Office rejected this overture. He decided to fly to London himself to plead for reason. There he met for three hours with the British cabinet. Its members were divided. Some argued for a continued hard line, but others agreed that it might be wise to send an emissary to Tehran. Prime Minister Attlee decided to dispatch the Lord Privy Seal, Sir Richard Stokes, a wealthy member of the British elite with no experience in the Middle East. Stokes was instructed to tell Mozadeg that the oil company would accept the principle that Iran's oil belonged to Iran, and also that it was now willing to share its profits on a 50-50 basis. The British must, however, remain in control of all drilling, refining, and export operations. This was, in essence, the same offer that Basil Jackson had brought to Tehran six weeks earlier, though Stokes was told not to admit this fact. He was to remain within the limits of Jackson's offer, but could dress it up and present its main points in different order, together with trimmings or sweetenings as might be required. The first question Mozadeg asked Stokes when the two men met for the first time was whether he was Roman Catholic. When Stokes replied that he was, Mozadeg told him that he was unsuited for his mission because Catholics do not believe in divorce, and Iran was in the process of divorcing the Anglo-Iranian oil company. Stokes was not amused. What Mozadeg was doing to Anglo-Iranian, he replied, was closer to murder than divorce. That exchange set the talks off on a sour note. They were further complicated by Anglo-Iranian's decision on July 31st to shut the Abaddon refinery. Company officials said that they had no alternative. Storage tanks were full, and tankers could not sail since their captains had been instructed not to sign the receipts Iran was demanding. It was a shattering step that reflected how deep the crisis had become. Stokes knew full well that he was offering Mozadeg a deal that the Prime Minister had already rejected. In a cable home, Stokes said that the essence of his offer was to keep Anglo-Iranian operating as before, but under a new name, and lamented that he had tried a number of devices by which we could disguise this hard fact, but found nothing. That was not either dangerous or too transparent for even the Persians to accept. For his part, Mozadeg declared himself willing to negotiate three points only the continued sale of Iranian oil to Britain to meet its domestic needs, the transfer of British technicians to the service of the new national Iranian oil company, and the amount of money Iran, Iran would pay for Anglo-Iranian nationalized assets. As the talks ground on toward inevitable failure, Stokes and Harriman flew to Abaddon for a look around. The different ways they occupied themselves reflected their vastly different approaches to the crisis. Stokes was quickly caught up in a diplomatic flap when the British consul first tried to expel Iranian officials from Abaddon and then flew into a rage when an Iranian car drove ahead of his in the caravan escorting Stokes from the airport. The consul wrote an angry letter to the local governor demanding assurances that in the future the representatives of his, his majesty's government 
is not subjected to such indignities. Iran's foreign ministry responded by expelling him from the country. Before departing, he cabled London to suggest that he wait in Basra so that he could be of assistance in the event of a military action. Harriman made better use of his time. He toured Abaddon and sent a cable to Truman reporting that the, slum, that the slums he saw there were shocking for housing of employees of a large western oil company. In later cables, he complained that the British held a completely 19th century colonial attitude toward Iran. Instead of negotiating seriously, they issued only rash statements and impulsive expressions of resentment about what they considered the theft of their property in Iran. I frankly feel that if the British government does not cooperate, he concluded, it will make the success of my mission extremely doubtful, if not impossible. Harriman's nerves were further frayed by an attack of in intestinal, dis intestinal disorder and the sweltering midsummer heat. The palace where he was staying in Tehran was lavish, but only a few languid fans to stir the oppressive air. Desperate for relief, he began taking long flights to provincial capitals aboard his official plane, which was air-conditioned. He ordered that the cabin be, made, cabin be made as cold as possible, and he and his aides wrapped themselves in blankets while they enjoyed the chill. When Vernon Walters suggested that using a plane that burned 800 gallons, gallons of fuel per hour in order to cool off was a bit excessive, Harriman bristled in reply. If you'd seen my income taxes over a period of years, you would know that I have bought a number of these for the United States government. Was it egg met several more times with Stokes, and at one point handed him a memorandum that seemed to offer a glimmer of hope. If the British would accept the right of Iranians to control their oil industry, he wrote, he would fully and fairly negotiate the oil company's just claims for compensation. Stokes was intrigued and cabled the foreign office, asking permission to explore what seemed to him a promising offer. The, the reply was stern, containing two brusque orders. There were to be no further concessions, and Stokes was to break off the talks and return forthwith to London. On August 22nd, the British cabinet imposed a series of economic sanctions on Iran. They prohibited the export of key British commodities, including sugar and steel, to Iran, directed the withdrawal of all British personnel from Iranian oil fields and of all but a hard core of about 300 administrators from Abadan and blocked Iran's access to the hard currency accounts of British banks. The next day, Stokes left Tehran. The result is nothing, Mozadegh admitted at a news conference. It is no good. Everything is finished. As Stokes departed, Prime Minister Attlee sent a triumphant cable to Truman. I think you'll agree breakdown in talks entirely due to Persian side. He wrote, only, only course now is we hope for complete U.S. public support of His Majesty's his Majesty's government's position. His appeal fell on deaf ears. Truman was mightily disappointed by the failure of Harriman's mission, but placed much of the blame on Britain's intransigence. In a reply cable, he insisted that neither the British nor the Americans should take any steps that would appear to be in opposition to the legitimate aspirations of the Iranian people. Harriman paid a call on the Shah before leaving Tehran, and during their meeting, he made a discreet suggestion. Since Mozadegh was making it impossible to resolve the crisis on a basis acceptable to the West, he said, Mozadegh might have to be removed. Harriman knew the Shah had no way of removing Mozadegh at, the, at that moment. By bringing up the subject, however, he foreshadowed American involvement in the coup two years later. It was a mission unlike any other, Vernon Walters wrote afterward. There was an Alice in Wonderland quality to which led me after three days to write back to Harriman, Mr. Harriman's secretary in Washington to ask her to send me a copy of that book so I would know what was next on the program. It was, in a sense, a mission that failed, but it was a mission that cast a long shadow ahead on the great problems that the Western world was to have with oil two, with oil two and a half decades later. These, Dr. Mozadegh, these Dr. Mozadegh was not to live to see, yet in a way their true origin led back to him. Have a good day, friends.